O oh God, who by calling us to the vocation of a medical technologist, has placed upon us the obligation of being a constant help in the scientific care of the sick, grant us by thy divine light a deep insight into the serious responsibilities of our task. By thy divine wisdom, awaken in us a growing zeal and determination to increase our knowledge of how to search for the underlying causes of sickness and disease, how to recognize the evidence of physical changes, how to make important chemical analyses and other valuable tests so helpful in caring for the sick. By the divine love, permit us in this way to share with those who directly care for the sick, that thus we may be constantly working through the eternal physician, Christ our Lord. Amen. Mga kababayan, ang pambansang awit ng Pilipinas. Ladies and gentlemen, the Pamet Hymn. Good evening to our colleagues who are here in our Zoom platform, as well as for our colleagues who are participating in this virtual event through live streaming in the official Facebook account of the Philippine Association of Medical Technologists. The COVID-19 pandemic had led to unprecedented shifts in our healthcare resources. And undoubtedly, these shifts in resources 
have a deep impact in our laboratory facilities. Therefore, this webinar organized by the Philippine Association of Medical Technologists through the Committee on Professional Development and Leadership is very timely as for this evening, we are going to discuss about strategic leadership in the clinical laboratory during the pandemic. This is a critical issue as we, we course through our recovery plan in a post-pandemic era and as we try to live with the current pandemic that we are hurdling. Before we start this virtual event, let me remind our participants of the guidelines that we need to follow for this particular webinar. By the way, I'm Oliver Shane R. Dumawal, the Regional Director for PAMET Southern Luzon. Now going back to our webinar guidelines. Microphones and cameras are disabled by the host for the duration of the webinar. Please ensure a stable internet connection to maximize learning and participation in this webinar. An open forum will be held after the lectures and participants may post their questions regarding the lectures delivered by our very able resource speakers after all the speakers have delivered their discussions. The link for the webinar evaluation and e-certificates will be flashed at the conclusion of the webinar and will be open for 60 minutes after the webinar had ended. For those who are participating via our Facebook live streaming, a different link will be provided to you. So even though you are not here in our Zoom platform and you are joining us this evening through our Facebook live streaming, you are still eligible for an e-certificate provided that your PAMET membership is updated for the year 2021 and beyond. This activity is credited with 1.5 CPD units and is provided for free as an advocacy of the Philippine Association of Medical Technologists led by our national president, Mr. Romel Saceda. To formally open our webinar for this evening, let us hear her opening remarks. Honorable Marian M. Tantinko, member of the PRC Professional Regulatory Board of Medical Technology and also a member of the PAMET Professional Development and Leadership Committee. Ma Marian? Thank you very much, Professor Domawal. I am very pleased to be here with you tonight in this very important PAMET webinar on strategic leadership in the clinical laboratory during a pandemic. For decades, while head nurses and chief nurses, doctors are enjoying their popularity with patients, we med techs, whether lab supervisors, chief med techs, or section heads, or regular med techs, we are confined in the laboratory. And the most known among us are what they call the vampires of the hospital. The pandemic, however, brought a sudden switch to highlight the importance of the work of a medtech or a medical laboratory scientist. Not just because we're doing the nasopharyngeal swab, the RT-PCR, but our deep involvement in the diagnosis and monitoring of the condition of the patient. While our mindset brings us always, as we are defined by RA5527, as <coughs> a person who engages in the work of a medic under the supervision of pathologists. <clears throat> While being one is uh, not demeaning at all, uh, and it does not mean that a medic has no chance to become a leader. Leadership in the lab brings us beyond being just section heads, supervisors or chief medics. Some of us have become administ administrators, lab managers, some uh, beyond the, the clinical lab have 
are in the academe, professors, deans, managers of the diagnostic companies, uh, owners of uh, diagnostic companies, owners of laboratories, and uh, other admin positions within and beyond the scope of the lab. Now, PAMET aims to capacitate MedTech in various pathways and various careers. Today, it brings us to strategies to carry out leadership in spite and because of the pandemic. Through uh, our very able and expert MedTech and uh, leaders who will speak to us tonight. And so without further ado, in behalf of PAMET, I welcome you all to this very important webinar. We hope that you learn much from this. And thank you very much for joining us tonight. Back to you, Sir Oliver. Thank you very much, Honorable Marian M. Tantinko, again, a member of the PRC Professional Regulatory Board for MedTech and a member of the PAMET Professional Development and Leadership Committee. Indeed, this pandemic had highlighted the very significant role of medical technologists in battling and enabling our collaborative efforts to combat this virus. Thank you very much for those warm words, Ma Marian. So for this event, and with the objective of PAMET to capacitate our medical technologists in terms of professional uh, development and leadership, we have prepared two significant lectures which are aimed towards developing your knowledge base regarding strategic leadership during this pandemic. To introduce our first speaker, we have a member of the PAMET Professional Development and Leadership Committee, Professor Lerma de la Liana Paris. I'm Lerma. Thank you very much, Sir Oli. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues in the medical technology profession. Our speaker is a living inspiration to the profession, which is an amalgamation of both the mentor and the student, the ones young and the young ones. If one takes a closer look at the chemistry of an achieving individual, besides the virtues of perseverance and hard work, she exemplifies a pioneering spirit and the willingness to learn a living idiom of a professional who happened to transcend the field of medical technology coupled with an impressive background. She has a rich work experience as a QA or quality assurance officer and the auditor for ISO accreditation, a lecturer, a reviewer for the Louisiana Mentors Review Center. She also occupies several positions in the different relevant health and healthcare associations in the Philippines, Singapore, and elsewhere. Currently, she is a director of the PAMET National Board and the immediate past president of PAMET Singapore. She is enrolled and has earned 33 units in Master in Hospital Administration at the University of the Philippines, Manila. Among the most the awards, highest of which were awarded to her are Most Outstanding Medical Technologist of 2019 by the Philippine Association of Medical Technologists and the Most Outstanding Professional in the Field of Medical Technology, also in the same year by the Professional Regulation Commission. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues in the medical technology profession, our first speaker, is a proven framework of excellence, an embodiment of achievement, a colleague, an associate, and a friend. Currently, she is the chief medical technologist of the Baguio General Hospital and Medical Center. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming our speaker, Ms. Zarlene Arbanania, to talk on strategic decision-making during pandemic, a government clinical laboratory experience. 
Hi, good evening, wow. everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Ma'am Lerma, for that very generous and touching uh, introduction. Okay, so good evening, colleagues. And um, please, I'm very pleased actually to share our experience during this pandemic in a government institution, of course. Okay, so again, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. Hope everyone is uh, good this evening, despite uh, Taiwan Kiko, actually. And uh, stay safe, everyone, actually. Okay, the aim of this talk is to present and share our tertiary institution's experience with managing the COVID-19 pandemic and offer practical considerations lab management and lab management principles. So to start with, actually, the past, I mean, the past year, 2022, has forced many of us to make difficult decisions, not just professional, but even our personal. So this time, of course, is a different one. And to start with, what is, by the way, uh, strategic decision making? It says that it is choosing the best path to success, evaluating the pros and cons of a situation and develops stepwise approach to realize your goals. And as a result, it will help you formulate a plan of action and align your term goals with the big picture. Strategic decision making, actually, there are actually different models and even processes. But here is one that is very practical, which is the three stage process circle of strategic decisions model. And bear in mind that the center of this is your organization's purpose. Actually, this is a learning process that first you have to analyze what's in front or what is at stake. Then you have to decide on what to do, then implement. Of course, it might not be perfect. There will be mistakes along the way, but keep on learning. That's why it is actually a learning process. So know what's in the middle. So know your mission, vision, and anchor from there. And it will be the basis actually of what you will decide on. Actually, the CLSI document 36A series of 2014 is lab preparedness during the COVID-19 pandemic. Actually, it is a planning for laboratory operations during disaster. And this is an essential document during the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, this is actually a lab emergency preparedness document and Chapter 10 specifically, which deals with planning for influenza easily, can be adapted to our current institution. An overlooked aspect of emergency planning addressed in this document, the CLSI document, is the emotional impact over time that working in an emergency has on employees. Initially, actually, people come together as a team to tackle an overwhelming problem. But as time moves on and staff continue to work under stressful conditions, ignoring personal needs becomes unsustainable. Then here comes the COVID-19 pandemic. And what is it that we actually were, you know, brought us? stress even up to this day. It is actually caused by infection with the severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2 or SARS-CoV-2, the virus strain. The experience at the clinical laboratory. It's been more than a year and we at the Department of Pathology at the Baguio General Hospital and Medical Center actually 
lumalaban po kami. And we are actually, until now, still standing tall. We have LTO. And which is, of course, we have to stand true to this. Our LTOs, our license to operate as a clinical laboratory, a certified RIVDA, and of course, a molecular biology laboratory. So actually, the Department of Pathology has 130 personnel. And with that, of course, not all medical technologists, but there are also consultants. In fact, there are 18 doctors and the rest are medical technologists, one ward assistant and admin assistant. Services, we have the clinical and of course the anatomic. For the clinical, we have the blood bank, clinical chemistry, hematology, serology, clinical microscopy, parasitology, clinical microbiology, and the molecular bio biology laboratory, which act Actually, up to this day, we continue to provide these services. Aside from that, we also have the, the anatomic portion of the Department of Pathology, which of course serves histopath services, cytology, and autopsy services. The experience. So what are we going to do with the onset of the pandemic, the COVID-19? How will we do it? decision-making in uncertain times. So there are actually strategies, as they say. Some that I read first, they say, is to take a breath and look back. But whatever it is, know what you'll do and what you will become and how you will do it, of course. Of course, this is not possible, not me on just the decision-making, but of course, we have our heads and of course, the laboratory and the top management of the organization. First, we had to consider, of course, as per ISO 9001 under the quality management system, are the resources, which is under standard seven. And when we say resources, actually, this includes both the human resources and the infra. Included in that, of course, are the equipment. So first, we actually had to attend to our staff. What would we do during this time? So first thing that we did was to have a contingency schedule. Well, actually, contingencies, because this is something urgent that we need to implement, and this is not normal. Thus, the normal schedule, from the normal schedule, we had to put up four teams. What is the purpose, of course, that is to protect each member and, of course, the further spread of infection. You know, contact tracing will be easier if um, staff will be, you know, like in constant company. So actually, per team, it was, I mean, there is an assigned team leader, a PUM or specimen processor, PUI, a biosafety officer, this actually team goes on a 12-hour duty, seven to seven. They do the work or give the laboratory results. They also perform the blood extraction during their shift, which is extraction time is from 10 in the morning to in the afternoon and early in the morning. Then there came, of course, the triage, it's because the organization put up a triage center wherein everyone will pass through this center. And what does the staff there do? Well, she accepts laboratory request form, collects that specimen from the PUIs, releases laboratory results, regularly checks and replenishes laboratory supplies in the area, strictly observes proper waste disposal, and actually, this schedule starts on Saturdays and ends on Sundays. As weeks went by during this pandemic, alternative work arrangements were actually promulgated 
and this is as per pursuant to civil service resolution promulgated on May 7, 2020, the commission actually adopted the following revised interim guidelines for alternative work arrangements and support mechanisms for workers in the government during the period of state of national emergency due to COVID-19 pandemic. Well, again, you're actually hearing an experience from a government, a clinical laboratory. So what are the alternative work arrangements? Aside from the themes actually that we plotted, there came an order from the human resource because it's an promulgated by C civil service for an alternative work arrangement. So what about this one? Actually, there are actually several of these alternative work arrangements that the government institution has to implement. First is the work from home, which is you an employee has to report two to three days at work or at the hospital and the rest of the days to complete the 40 hours work schedule will be done at home. But of course, this is uh, output oriented, okay? The second one is a four day work week, which is pursuant to CSC resolution. This is actually the compressed work week wherein an employee has to work 10 hours per day to complete the 40 hours and will have the rest of the days as off. So for example, her schedule is Monday to Thursday, then seven to seven. Ah, no, it's actually seven to five, which is 10 hours for four days. So the usual eight hours per day working time is uh, compressed. And in view of the transport concerns, a gliding flex time is allowed also. And it, an employee cannot report earlier than 7 a.m. and end not later than 8 p.m. Because during this time, actually the organization provided transport for employees. However, with whatever work schedule, or alternative work arrangement that you would choose, you better ensure that the completion of the 40 hours work week is completed. Definitely during this time or during this pandemic, there was actually staff movement. Molecular laboratory was given additional number of staff from the initial four to start with. And the staff, regardless of section, merged to form a team. It was after actually several months, after five months, that staff were sent back to their respective sections. They went back, or we decided to put them back to the eight hours regular duty with coverage of the 24 hours with three ships in between. And of course, it was then that the start of approval of mandatory leaves started. We know then that the staff actually needed time to rest, especially during those times, they were the ones covering for their um, co-workers. Actually, there were, you know, times when teams were like um, short of uh, staff is because some were, you know, turned out positive or some were like quarantined to take care of uh, family members who turned positive. Safety, safety, of course, was equally important then. We had to draft interim guidelines in response to the COVID-19, like guidelines on reporting for and signing out of duty, especially with the teams then. We made sure that there is no overlap of personnel 
and that there was um, the exit and the entrance uh, they should not, of course, meet. I mean, when you sign in for work from the biometrics area down, and it's a different um, area for the exit when you sign out from work. We also crafted the AP guideline on laboratory testing during the pandemic. Safety interim guidelines also on COVID-19 on laboratory testing, which was in May last year. And of course, the guideline on handling specimens for lab testing in the anatomic pathology section during the COVID-19 pandemic. And what is, of course, equally important is the biosafety protocol for SARS-CoV-2 contingency response. This actually embodies the proper use of PPE, the PPE is to be used, you know, all those things, proper sanitation. And all the, of these interim guidelines were already registered and controlled or COVID proof in compliance to ISO standard in which DGHMC is certified. We had to make sure that if these were just temporary, then we believe that we are in this new normal and such would be used during this new normal. That's why we had them registered and controlled. Staff training during these times or learning and development, staff schedule for trainings were actually recalled. We had staff then who were sent for actual, or uh, what they call that, actual trainings uh, to institutions in Manila, like NKTI. But it was during this time actually that this pandemic started. Face-to-face -face learnings, lecture seminars, and we shifted, all these things were shifted to this uh, to online webinars. And however, targets for learning and development did not change. Communication. Communications were actually cascaded online through different platforms, the Zoom, the WebEx. Meetings were also done online. Chat groups were created via Viber or Messenger. And in an ever-changing emergent situation with daily tasks and the workforce influx, communicating effectively becomes more challenging. We need to speak precisely. Actually, avoiding the use of imprecise descriptors like he, she, and that was minimized for, to minimize confusion, of course, and inefficiency. In short, be direct, not he, but rather straight on the staff name. Services. During this time, statistics and consumptions, of course, statistics declined, of course. Other tests were unavailable. It's because the protocol of requesting by physicians changed during this time. So there is the use of the dimer the procalcitonin, the ferritin as part of the COVID test panel. However, we continue to provide those services. Although at times there were, of course, operation was not perfect, especially for the government institution when procurement is of course under the Republic, Republic Act number uh, 9184, which is the Government Procurement Act. So everything has a process. So we have the Procurement Management Office who actually takes charge of procurement. Reality is, yes, there are unavailable tests of this time. It's because of like issues in the process of procurement. But we continue to provide this service because of the memorandum of agreements that we crafted with the different uh, has laboratory nearby, laboratories nearby. 
infrastructure, which is one of the resources that I was actually mentioning. And with such restructuring and improvements, of course, was, um, I mean, was implemented. And the main reception area underwent major changes. It was totally restructured because now we have to maintain social distancing. And so we also had to implement the unidirectional staff movement. Unauthorized personnel were not allowed then. It used to be that our receiving area actually is that they come in the laboratory, but now we move our accession areas or our receiving um, areas nearest the door of the laboratory and our waiting area now actually outside the laboratory. Every space actually was utilized during this time. And as the months went by, of course, social distancing, physical distancing has always been reminded by our Infection Prevention and Control Committee. And of course, it's not just, of course, the responsibility. It should be everyone's responsibility. And it should be our responsibility to remind our colleagues that really there should be no eating together. And in fact, communications also were done through signages like this, please avoid eating together. What you do not know might hurt you. And that's actually a friendly reminder from our Infection Prevention and Control Committee. Why no eating together? Because it has always been that when staff gets tested and turns out to be positive, and when history taking is done, it turns out that they ate together during meal times or even stop time, which sometimes it's the only breather that we have in the laboratory. But actually, it should not be. Rewards. Yes, during this time, we have our compensation. We have our benefits. But actually, what is more rewarding are the acts of kindness, the words of encouragement, and the prayers that we receive from people who care for the health workers. Actually, it's during this time that, yes, actually, we are the frontliners. And so thank you to people who actually acknowledge that. As an experience again during this time, it actually gives us the inspiration. It's because we receive sometimes food staff, food deliveries come to us in the laboratory. And food staff, sometimes a coffee and a biscuit. And yes, one time, plants, yes. May mga plants na din pong nabibigay. Rewards. Aside from this food stuff, which, um, of course, attach with, you know, missives or short notes, face mask, face shields, coveralls, the bunny suits were also given to us for free. We also have the alcohols, carboys, or even gallons of them. And yes, those who really and truly cared also gave those vitamins to keep us strong, of course. Other rewards, big or small. And what's actually touching is that, you know, these people, they acknowledge like this one, thank you for your sacrifices and hard work, God bless, which means a lot, of course, to us as health workers. 
the latest of which actually that I received through an email came from a Christian volunteer who said, who actually attached this card, but with that, is a short missive thanking the frontliners. And it's really touching. This rewards could actually, I mean, not really, of course, more important, but it's it actually, it gives us pleasure to work harder. We are much grateful for all your sacrifices and hard work. Please continue to stay safe. Do not give up in doing good. And we look forward to the future for no resident will say, I am sick. So to everyone, to fellow medical technologists, to our frontliners, stay positive, even when it feels like you're like, your life is falling apart. Actually, it is very depressing during this time. And I always tell that waking up to go to work is already a struggle in the morning. Because yes, it's kind of depressing that then Minsan. And actually, I have uh, colleagues who I can see sometimes that it's getting into them already. But staying positive should be the most important, important thing that we bear in mind right now. Stay positive even when it feels like your life is falling apart. We are in this all together. And here's praying that you will be filled with his mighty glorious strength so that you can keep going no matter what. I hope that this experience somehow enlightened you or maybe some lessons learned or maybe after this, you can also contribute. But this is how we are doing it at the Department of Pathology of the Baguio General Hospital and Medical Center. And with that, thank you very much. There is hope for everyone. Here, I'm, here are my references. Again, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Zarlin. Again, I echo what she said, there is hope for everyone. And indeed, through our collaborative efforts as medical technologists, we will be able to end this current pandemic. Thank you very much for those wonderful words and inspiring, uh, inspiring stories from your experience handling the pandemic from the perspective of a med tech working in a government run facility all the way from the city of Pines. Ladies yeah. and gentlemen, Ms. Arlene Bananya. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, Ali. So reserve your questions for our first speaker. We will be having an open forum later after all of our plenary discussions had been concluded. So at this point, let me now call on another member of the PAMET Professional Development and Leadership Committee and an Associate Dean from the University of Santo Tomas Faculty of Pharmacy, Department of Medical Technology, to introduce our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Maria Frida Z. Hapan. Thank you very much, Sir Oliver Dumawal. Good evening, everyone. Tonight, the task of introducing our next speaker is both an honor and privilege. Our next speaker is a man of virtue and simplicity, a dear colleague and a friend. He is in fact a modern day hero serving as a frontliner during this pandemic and an inspiration to all medical technologists. 
A closer look at the alchemy of our speaker will reveal a person with pioneering spirit, passion, and devotion in whatever he does. A man of many achievements and a leader in his own right. Our speaker is the current department manager of the Institute of Pathology, St. Luke's Medical Center, Quezon City. Moreover, he is the newly elected National President of the Philippine Association of Medical Technologists. Ladies and gentlemen, to talk about situational leadership during the pandemic, a private clinical laboratory experience, let us all welcome our PAMET National President, Mr. Romel F. Saceda. Thank you very much, Ma'am Fida, for that very nice um, introduction. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, I'll be talking about the situational leadership during pandemic, a private clinical laboratory experience. So uh, I will be presenting to you um, my, my, my experience in the laboratory and uh, we will go directly to, to our lecture. And then um, uh, primarily um, when the pandemic started, um, the question is, are we really ready to face this um, current situation? So in our laboratory, um, um, initially we are just um, collecting samples and we are just swabbing uh, patients in the in the emergency department, and we're sending it to uh, to um, RITM. But now, um, um, during that time, um, my section in microbiology are really experiencing a hard time collecting all those samples um, because um, we are not yet ready to, to do it because we're just collecting samples and sending into RITM. So there is a different the, uh, um, factors that we have to consider, like the manpower who will transport the specimen, um, if we will be able to cope up with the turnaround time. So um, um, let me share with you our challenges in the clinical setup um, during this pandemic. So number one is our manpower. And number two, the resources and reagents, equipments, and et cetera. Number three is the facility. And lastly, is the information technology. So um, let us go one by one onto, in, um, onto those challenges. So number one is the adaptability. So initially, um, people in the, in the molecular laboratory were able to, to do things um, inside the COVID lab. But as time goes by and there's a surge of specimens in the, uh, we are receiving because in molecular laboratory, they do everything. Um, so they do the receiving, they do the, the, the releasing, the processing and encoding and et cetera. So, but as time goes by, na, ma makikita natin sa mga, mga tao na they are already burned out. So um, some of them are just sleeping inside the laboratory and then they woke up and then they go in and then they, they're just um, taking a bath in the, in, the, in the lab. And then afterwards they go directly to, to their work. So when it comes to scheduling, um, we have only eight people in the molecular laboratory. So we are not only doing the COVID lab or the COVID testing in the, in the section, but also, we are doing other things like the flow cytometry, the histocompatibility testing, and other molecular procedures. So um, we need to divide the people. So for eight people, we need to divide it into two. So four will be doing the, the COVID and the four will be doing the rest of the procedures in the lab. But um, due to the search of specimens, 
um, nagiging 24 hours minsan ng duty nila. So kung mapasok and then umuuwi, maliligo lang and then papasok ulit. So um, as a mitigation, we add a three um, personnel in the molecular laboratory. And then, um, um, but that, that additional three is still not sufficient. So um, as a DOH requirements, we need to have a separate like um, on the receiving area, the, the re encoding of the results, the analysis of the samples. So we decided to, to, um, to get other staff in the laboratory, other sections in the laboratory. But as time goes by, uh, pataas pa rin ng pataas sa mga samples, hindi pa rin siya nagsusuffice doon sa aming, sa aming operations. So some of the procedures are, are affected. Um, so yung iba, may, um, kulang na yung mga reagents, wala na kaming, wala na kaming pang run, dahil nga most of the people are now focused with COVID. And then afterwards, uh, we decided also na to get other um, other people outside the laboratory. So, so um, during that time, we need to train all of them doing those procedures in the lab. But most most likely, ang pinapagawa lang namin sa kanila are receiving and um, encoding of results. So those other medics outside the laboratory. And then, so in the in our lab, um, we do, we didn't experience the work from home like other departments in the hospital. Kasi nga, di ba, um, kami yung mismong gumagawa doon sa lab. So, hindi kami pwedeng magkulang. So, in our hospital, um, we have, um, we are, I can say that we are a little bit versed doon sa paggawa ng mga molecular procedures because not all of the people in the laboratory, uh, in, the, in the molecular lab, knows how to do that procedure. So, selected people lang. So, we need to, ski, we need to train them on what we are doing with the molecular. So, um, so may body-body system, so naapektuhan pa rin ng operations, yung turnaround time, there's a lot of complaints because nadidelay yung mga results. Uh, primarily, nung nagkaroon ng pandemic, um, our result is four to seven days, but now um, the result is already, uh, can be released within 24 hours. So, um, and um, so yung mga tao, we need to send them to other other institutions like with RITM to to um to to be trained and to, for them to be more aware about the biosafety and biosecurity um, um practices. And then when it comes to attitude attitude of the people, so siguro no na napapagod, siyempre pagod na rin, burnout na rin sila. So um, uh, some of them are um, basta lang makapasok, ma-perform yung procedures, and then they go home. So as I observed them, so since dati akong taga molecular, so I decided to perform also in the lab. So I'm also um, performing the procedures or on the analytic area of the laboratory. So I'm the one extracting the RNA. So I extract RNA 800 samples in a day. So and then some I assign someone to do the PCR and I send, assign someone to do the the encoding and the releasing of the results. So para lang makita natin na um, yung support ng mga managers sa kanila in nandoon pa rin para mas malakas yung maging yung loob nila. And then um another issues naman na encounter namin just like um, with ma what Ma'am Sarlene said, na pag nag-turn nag out positive yung mga tao sa loob ng molecular lab, um, talagang pilay na pilay ang pilay na pilay ang section. And then um, some of the relatives get infected also, so mahuhum quarantine sila, so maiipit na naman kami sa aming procedures sa mga ginagawa namin. So sometimes we go to work at 7 o'clock and then we, we, we go home at 11 in the evening. So sometimes yung maabot pa ng 12 midnight kasi syempre sometimes meron tayong mga kailangan mga i-troubleshoot pa doon sa laboratory. So our management is very supportive on this. So what are the things that they offer to us? So number one, they give us the, um, the free meal. So they give us the free breakfast, lunch, dinner, so they supply it. Uh, they supply it to us. 
And then number two, um, they also give us a free accommodation. So we have a hotel where we can stay. And then um, number three, um, they also give us a free transportation to those who want to go home. So, and then number four, um, the gratuity pay. Na-increase po yung grat gratuity pay. So, talagang makakabus ng moral ng mga tao sa laboratory. No? So, another thing in, in the manpower is also the pathologists. So, sa pathologists kasi po, um, napaka-konti during the pandemic. Konti pa lang naman po yung mga pathologists namin na know how to do the molecular testing. So, um, so um, we need to train also the we also train we need to train the other pathologies to do it so initially um we added additional um two person to read but still um lacking so marami pa rin kami nagkakaroon ng mga delays and then um next um we do it um seven pathologists so those seven pathologists are already reading the covid testing so medyo umokay okay na kami doon dahil nagkaroon na ng na smooth na reading. And then, syempre, papasok din po doon yung competency with the pathologist. Syempre, um, hindi pa sila ganun kagamay sa una um, nung konti pa lang yung mga pathologist na dinadagdag pa lang po namin. So, um, yung competency, uh, medyo matagal, mabagal pa. Syempre, they also ask, uh, ask other expert na doon sa, um, sa testing and then um availability sometimes nagkakaroon ng problema with availability um because um dahil 24/7 nga sila reading they read it whole day hanggang 12 midnight so syempre napapagod din po sila so sometimes we need to call them because some of the patients are already following it up yung mga results so nagkakaroon ng problema doon pero Sa ngayon po, nakompleto na po yung lahat ng mga everyday way decking na po ng mga pathologist. We are now um, having a smooth flow of the, of the reading process. And then for the resources, um, supply chain coordination. During the time po of the pandemic, um, the supply chain coordination is not that involved in our area. Since dahil nga um, bago pa lang siya, hindi pa alam yung cycle, hindi pa alam yung proper ordering. So gawain din po ng laboratory during that time. We do our direct purchase. So um, yan na nagiging ano dahil nakakaroon nga po ng problema when it comes to the supplies. So kami na rin po ang nag-allocate no? sa so, sobrang dami ng mga ng brands uh, we need to um to choose properly kung ano po yung pwede naming gamitin. So we do um backup of other other um materials like the swabs, um, the BTM, so um, and other um products or items na ginagamit po sa testing. And then for validation of the kits, sa validation po ng kits napakadaming lumalabas before. So we need to validate, we need to check kung if they approve na siya, uh, approve ba siya ng RITM. So those are the things na medyo naging struggle namin kasi we need to wait for that. And then um, for the equipment, um, currently nung una po namin ang testing, we only have one machine for COVID. But um, due to the surge, we need to get another one. So we get um, the other machine from other department and our research department for us to um, back up the, the, the testing, the running of the specimens. So, um, yung pun dalawang yon hindi pa rin siya enough dahil nga, di ba, ang mga patients, they want, na, they want to have that, uh, their results as soon as possible. So, um, dahil po continuous pa rin yan, nagkakaroon pa rin po ng mga problema when it comes to the releasing of the results, we acquire another machine. So we have three machines already in the laboratory for COVID. So far, um, we already achieved the 24 hours releasing of the results. And then for budget allocation, since hindi nga po tayo prepared dito sa, sa COVID-19 uh, pandemic, um, we did uh, the reallocation of all our budgets para po mga, makuha po namin yung mga dapat naming bilhin during this pandemic. Dahil nga po, like for example, the, the PPEs, tumataas po yung tumataas na po yung um, ang, ang COVID. So major, um, some of our people in the lab are now um, increased. Uh, Nag-order na po kami ng, ng sobrang mga gloves, mga mask para lang po masupply doon sa lahat ng mga staff. 
So in global shortage, um, I'm pertaining po with other procedures ng laboratory. So dahil po nga, dahil sa COVID, so napaprioritize po yung COVID, some of the procedures in the laboratory na, na natitigil dahil nga po um, wala pong supply. Dahil na, na nabablock po siya sa customs or sometimes soon pa lang po sa bansang pinanggagalingan ay hindi na rin po nakakaderecho dito sa atin. Okay, so when it comes to facilities, in, in, in infrastructure po namin, um, we are a little bit um, um, okay. So during that time ng initial accreditation, um, um, we only have to add um, the under room kasi uh, meron na po kaming unidirectional na process sa laboratory. We have the pre-analytic, analytic, and the analytical room, uh, post-analytical room. So um so minimal na lang po yung mga inan. So sa disinfection um we make sure na every day na disinfect po yung aming aming area and when it comes to the rapid PCR on the in infrastructure ito po yung nagkaroon kami ng major uh, major um changes because um we need to convert the other rooms into a COVID laboratory lab. So in this case, Paul, we need also to acquire other uh, equipment like the biosafety cabinet and other machines. And of course, we have to add uh, people inside the, inside the COVID rapid lab. And then for safety, um, we immediately install um, the air purifier to all, all rooms of the COVID lab and other sections in the laboratory. And then um, uh, we also, um, and of course, the, we have a negative pressure room. And then we also install a UV light. So every day din po yon. So after running, they, they open the UV light para ma-disinfect po yung aming um, area. And then lastly, the information technology. So sa internet connection, sometimes nagkakaroon din po kami ng problem. So nagkakaroon ng mga glitches during the, 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 the process. So sa internet connection, nagkakaroon tayo ng issue because of nagkakaroon ng delay ng mga results. Dahil po uh, misa mahina yung mga internet connections natin. And then for the DOH data requirements, ito po yung mga additional data na kailangan ng mga DO, ng, ng DOH na kailangan po namin mag-comply. So sa mga ito, um, additional po siya na work para sa mga sa mga medtech dahil nga po um, after after doing this nung wala pa pong additional manpower, sila din po yung gumagawa nito. So um, para lang po mas mapadali the laboratory information system we have already a laboratory information system, but the COVID is not yet connected. So para mas ma-easy yung aming proseso, we, we connect the COVID testing in the laboratory information system, meaning there is just an interfacing and, sa, and, and all of the samples or the swab samples are already barcoded. So para hindi na po nagkakaroon ng delay when it comes to the receiving of specimens. And lastly, um, nagkakaroon po tayo ng frequent complaints because of falsification of, of, um, of the uh, results of the COVID-19. So actually, um, kahit ngayon na meron ng QR code, marami pa rin po tayo na-encounter na mga fals uh, nagpa-falsify ng mga results. So para po mas makita natin na mas um, okay po yung mga results, hindi po nadadaya, we, um, we put a QR code. Para po, um, even on the QR code, even the picture of the patient uh, will appear. Pag po doon sa QR code. Um, so far, um, yun lang po yung um, clinical experience ko sa laboratory. So um, to all my fellow medical technologists, please stay safe and don't forget to pray always. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sir Romel, for that very um, information-packed discussion on how you manage your COVID-19 situation and how you mitigated the effects of this current pandemic 
to your uh, private laboratory. So again, reserve your questions. Later, we will have an open forum for our two resource speakers and uh, the moderator for the open forum will be randomly picking up your questions in the chat box. Keep posting your questions in the chat box and we will be addressing them the, during the open forum later. So at this point, let us hear from the chair of the PAMET Professional Development and Leadership uh, Committee, Dr. Roberto G. Manawis, for the synthesis and frameworks for professional development and leadership under his stewardship. Sir Robert. Thank you, Sir Oliver. Uh, magandang gabi po sa ating lahat. And thank you uh, to uh, both of our uh, ABLE speakers for sharing their experiences and uh, the challenges that they did face during this pandemic. Uh, the, th thrust, the thrust of uh, this committee actually tonight is to share all of these experiences in order uh, for our practitioners to have some kind of models and uh, some kind of references and uh, 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 follow through approaches. And um, we thought of having two examples coming from uh, the government side, as well as the private side, in order to capture uh, the challenges that are being faced in the practice. And um, we are actually uh, very blessed tonight. In fact, their sharings were very personal and uh, very heartfelt, as I uh, told them. And that's why we are, we are very thankful for uh, the sharings that have been given. Uh, okay, let me uh, now share the slides that I would like to share with you. So um, tonight we thought of uh, sharing uh, the slides on modeling in order actually to uh, synthesize all of uh, what has been shared tonight, would like to, uh, to share with you some models that were derived from the sharings, both from private and government institutions. Well, assuming that all of our participants tonight are in the leadership posts, uh, either laboratory managers or chief medical technologists or uh, heads in the academe or even uh, at section heads, we hope that these uh, leadership resilience inter-COVID models would help you uh, come up with such kind of uh, an approach. Of course, the situation really came to us uh, so sudden and probably many of the organizations are unable to uh, react rapidly. And uh, the change that actually happened is categorized as a drastic change. And in which case, uh, rapid response need to be provided. So the first model that we would like uh, to present coming from the sharing from both the government and private institution is the PDCA model. Uh, the PDCA, I guess, is very much familiar to many of us. It's called PDCA because it begins with number one, we plan, and then after planning, number two, we do or execute the plan. And then thirdly, after executing, of course, we monitor by checking. And uh, when we check, based on what we've heard, we see some mismatches, misalignments, and then we act, okay? Meaning we have to re-improve and to improvise our processes in the clinical laboratory, whether government or private. And I think even in the context of the academe, the PDCA model can actually work as, um, a guide or a framework in developing uh, strategies and solutions to such drastic forms of changes. This is actually akin or similar to the Deming way where we have to understand the difficulty. When of course challenges like this happen in our organization, we sit down being leaders and decision makers in our clinical laboratory, we sit down to understand what are the points of difficulties. And then we locate the problem, which is practically what's happening here at the planning stage. Where are most of the problems really happening? Of course, there are so many problems. So in terms of prioritization, I think um, we have to um, apply the Pareto rule. 
Pareto rule actually says that 20% of the activities that we can do can solve 80% of our problems. And so we, when we understand where the problem is, we locate that problem, we define the problem. So it cannot be very generic. It has to be a very, very specific definition of the problem. And from there, we suggest possible solutions and develop the reasoning for the suggested influences. And then afterwards, we observe the applied solutions and here we go at the check and act already. So the Deming way and the PDCA concepts are the same. Now, moving forward, when we say plan actually, uh, and we mean identification of the problem and there's discover where the problem started and we, uh, our two resource speakers tonight told us uh, the sources of the problems, not only uh, personnel, resource problem, but also infrastructure resource problem, both from the private and government settings they were experienced. And what do you do? Okay, we plan the improvements and then we create a plan of action. So the, the thing is that these decisions rest on the shoulder of the heads. And uh, you being the selected audience here tonight, are the ones blessed with this kind of responsibility. So we thought as a committee, after the sharing of both the government and the private institution from Mam Zarlin and Sir Romel, to provide you a model so that it could be used as a guide if it will be your turn to do such kind of problem solving decision making. Now, when we speak of planning at the PDCA, what does it actually really entail? So first, so planning kasi is not part of our strength. Unfortunately, hindi tayo sanay to actually sit down and plan. So what do we really mean specifically when we say planning? First, we have to be very clear when we look at our organization and the clinical laboratory, where is the issue? What and where are the issues? And then uh, if the issues have been identified, we have to go there and observe and see is the problem really there? Is, is the lo loci no? or the locus of uh, the problem really in that appropriately stated place? And after which we now analyze the problem. And the sharing both from the government and private institution was actually very well stated in how, on how they analyze the problem and how they develop action plans. Of course, the early part of the stages were actually quite slow because it did not only entail the clinical laboratory. We learned from the sharings that when we do a PDCA, it is not only within the confines of the clinical lab, we will have to get to the administration. We will have to get to all the other stakeholders, our suppliers, our uh, partners in the industry, they will have to be incorporated into the solution forming activities. So let us not just confine our mindset into doing a PDCA inside a clinical laboratory. And when we say analyze, we really sit down here at the check. We sit down and analyze the a plan of actions that have been implemented and executed. And again, um, the privilege of doing this task is set uh, on the laurels of uh, the heads. And uh, some of the tools that we can use to analyze are the Pareto chart. Okay, or the check sheet that we use. Uh, and one thing that's very important is to emphasize that the PDCA concept or the plan, do, check, act concept is a continuous process improvement uh, operations. We do not stop. And as you can see, even now that both the government and the private uh, sharings are actually being told, they are telling us that they're still continuously doing some kinds of improvement in their processes. And um, apart from the PDCA model, we can also look at the eight-step process for leading change by Dr. John Cutter. This is actually one of the most common frameworks that we teach in operations and also in leadership. How does this work? It is an eight-step process. The change that actually happened to us again is drastic. So we need to do some kind of a model, to use some kind of a model in order for us to have a systematic approach of addressing change. The first step is to create a sense of urgency. How do you create a sense of urgency? We talk to our people. We tell them that you cannot 
really eat together. That when you come home, or come here to, uh, to office and to work, you really have to observe all the safety protocols. And they are part of, because if you don't do, you are going to go home and you're going to bring that infection back to your families, or you're going to infect the whole staff, and then we will be paralyzed. If you communicate like that very clearly to our people, the urgency is set. And when urgency is set, we build a guiding coalition. The, the guiding coalition will help us because the chief med tech, the laboratory managers, the section heads, they can't just do the work alone. It will have to be a group work. So we have to build a guiding coalition to be able to, to deliver that kind of a work. And then we create a strategic vision. We tell our people that if we work like this, we can be able to contribute something into the prevention of the overwhelming of the healthcare industry. And then of course, we keep enlisting more volunteers okay, into our team. And then afterwards, we do action by removing barriers. We identify what are the areas of, uh, of traffic, okay? and where people stop improving and implementing what has been agreed upon. And then, of course, uh, as shared with us by both the government and the private sharing, when there are wins, so let's say we were able to reduce the waiting time of our patient, we were able to improve our releasing time, we were able to actually um, work together as a team, we celebrate short-term wins, you know, even over a cup of coffee. Uh, but not in a group, uh, giving everyone, for example, chocolate, you know, a simple tap at the back would actually be enough for people to feel that there is celebration of an accomplishment as a group. And then when that actually is being achieved, there is an acceleration sustenance. We sustain such kind of change that has been accomplished with the whole group. And when it has been uh, accelerated, um, sustainably, we institute the change. We now tell them, okay, this is now our, our, goal, our uh, ways of doing things. From now on, this is how we're going to work together. This is a st eight step process and it is a continuous process. It will have to be shared by all the members of the group. Another model uh, that we would like to share is the ADCAR model. Uh, what is this kind of a model? This is also a change implementation model where uh, we begin with the pre-contemplation and then contemplation, the preparation, action, and then the maintenance. So basically translated into a simpler term. First, which is similar to uh, Cotter's eight-step model, we build awareness of what COVID is. And because of the implication of COVID, this is now the kind of work that we have to do. And people need to understand so that they will begin to desire to be part of the solution. And when now they begin to desire, we give them knowledge, we equip them, we empower them, we train them, okay? And then once they are given uh, this training, they begin to get competency. They begin to be able to do the work and then they will be able to help. And that will now be reinforcement. It is a staged process. You can read up on all of this. They are available anyway on the internet. And I'm, we're just presenting this to you as your possible guides, no? Because, you know, all of this model favor a particular type of leadership. Depende kung anong style po ang leadership ang meron kayo, magagamit nyo ang iba't ibang mga models na ito. I'm not saying you use all. You choose one based on what's actually applicable for you. And finally, we have this situational leadership model. The situational leadership model actually, actually is a journey uh, we begin with um, S1, which is actually equivalent to D1, then S2 equivalent to D2, S3 equivalent to D3, and S4 equivalent to D4. What is this journey? This is a journey first of situational means, kung anong sitwasyon ninyo sa hospital, doon kayo mag -umpisa. But from that situation, your form of leadership will have to be adapted. So for example, if you are a kind of your personality is very nice, very accommodating, very uh, friendly uh, leader. Uh, it might work, you know, if you are already uh, at a certain stage. But if you are directing and you are coaching, it may not work. 
because in directing and coaching, look at directing, the people have low competence, but they are willing to help. They have high commitment, but they have low competence. But in tests like RT-PCR, we cannot commit mistakes. So here, you, you have to be doing directing, okay? You cannot be very, very friendly here. You have to make sure that you're able to teach everything from ABCs into all the methodologies. And then uh, the person, of course, eventually gains confidence and they will move into a low level of com competence. Uh, and then uh, they probably will have low level of commitment at S2. So, kasi mapapagod yan, no? And then, matatakot, kagaya ng na-experience natin. So, dito, ang kinakailangan, ang approach ng leadership ay coaching. So, hindi ka nalang nagtuturo. You are now beginning to uh, put yourself in the shoes of your mentee, no? Or of your trainee. So, here, very high ang directive activities, pero very high din ang level ng support ng leader. Right, And then after some time, that person, the mentee, moves on to moderate high competence and variable commitment. Dito maingat ang pag-aalaga uh, pag sa mga uh, team members natin, mga kasama natin medtechs. Okay? And dito, there is now low level of directive kasi tumataas na ang level of competence. Hindi mo na kinakailangan i-guide at turuan, pero kinakailangan mong itap at the back. Busy, busy tahin from time to time. There has to be high supportive behavior until that person eventually becomes like you, a leader. And then that person will develop high competence and very high commitment. By that time, pwede ka nang mag-delegate. So it is a, it's, a, um, it's a journey of directing to coaching to supporting and then delegating. I hope that you can choose from any of these four models that you can choose to be applied in your clinical laboratories being heads. And um, again, depending on the kind of leader that you are, the personality that you have, you can choose from among uh, these four uh, models of leadership and implementation of change. So we spoke about the PDCA, we spoke about uh, Cutter's eight step of leading change, we spoke about ADCAR model, and now we spoke about the situational leadership model. And these are the references that we used in making these slides. We hope that um, the Professional Development Committee and all of its members were able to share with you all of these very important nuggets and that you would find them useful together with the sharing from Mom Zarlin Bananya and also from uh, Sir uh, Romel Maceda. This is uh, the offering of, of our committee from the Philippine Association of Medical Technologists. Maraming salamat po, and the members of our committee are uh, Ma'am Frida Hapan, Ma'am Lerma Paris, and Sir Edel Manahan. Thank you very much po, and God bless you. Back to you, um, Sir Oli. Thank you very much, Doc Robert, for that wonderful wrap up of the two lectures that we've had this um, evening. And uh, we were given several frameworks by uh, Doc Robert, the chair of the Public Professional Development and Leadership Committee that we can use. We have, he mentioned the PDCA cycle and the Pareto principle, the eight step process for leading change by Cotter and also the ADCAR methodology, as well as the situational leadership theory where we are using the supportive and directive behavior, which we can use as a pattern for the situational leadership for our chief medical technologists, section heads, laboratory managers, and all the med techs here in attendance who are in a leadership position in our respective laboratory facilities. And we hope that you will be able to use these frameworks in the context of your experiences as you lead your laboratory organization amidst this current pandemic. Thank you very much, Doc Robert, for that wonderful synthesis and the frameworks that you have provided for our participants. Thank you. So, um, I know you have lots of questions and I'm seeing a lot of questions in the chat box. So we will now go to the open forum for tonight's webinar. And to facilitate the open forum, 
It will be moderated by the Regional Director for Northern Luzon, Dean Edison D. Ramos. Good Edison. evening. Thank you very much, Sir Oliver. And uh, thank you to our two distinguished speakers and of course to the committee chair, Sir Robert. So the floor is now open for your questions or inquiries or if you have any additional information that you want to, to add. Or if you are shy enough to unmute yourself, you can type in your questions in our chat box. Okay, so I think we have several questions here. So let me read the first one. This one is addressed to Ma'am Zarlene. So may I uh, request Ma'am Zarlene and Sir Romel to please uh, uh, turn on their cameras. So this question is addressed to Ma'am Zarlene. So how were you able to deal with missed quotas in your laboratory knowing that we are getting affected by pandemic? Again, sir, how? How, how were you able to deal with missed quotas in your lab knowing that we are greatly affected by pandemic? Missed quota? Yes, yes, ma'am. Uh, who asked the question? May I? I think this one is from also from a practicing medical technologist. Uh, may I quota. clarify? Anong ibig niyang sabihin, sir, by missed quota during this pandemic? So the question is from Mr. Mike Patrick Iganya. So are you here? Can you unmute yourself and uh, clarify your questions? Yeah. You can raise your hand so we can unmute you. Mr. Mike Patrick Iganya. So missed quotas in your laboratory. Ano po kaya ang ibig niyang sabihin ng missed quotas? To do with the, with the test. With different testing. What's the name again of the participant? Mike, Mike Patrick Iganya. Oh, I think he's raising his hand. Yeah. Yes, yes, okay. Surely he's raising his hand. Ah, uh, hello, po. good evening. Yes, sir, good evening, Paul. Good evening, sir. Uh, yes, Paul. Uh, kasi po, uh, Chief Medical Technologist din po ako. Tapos, meron po kasi kami mga problems with in terms of reagents na hindi namin na-reach dahil mahina talaga yung turnout namin kasi nga pandemic. So, meron yung ibang companies na gusto na mag-pull out ng machines kasi hindi namin na-reach yung quotas. Oh, okay, sir. Actually, sir, sa government kasi, ang procurement namin is uh, guided by Republic Act 9184. So, per year yan, meron kaming project, uh, parang procurement plan, wherein, yes, you're right. Kasi nung 2020, talagang hindi namin na meet, but um, meron kaming ginawa, but definitely walang nag-pull out. It's because na inan namin muna, dinelay namin yung delivery schedule. It's a government yun, sir, ha? Kasi um, we are guided by um, Republic Act 9184, which is the procurement law for uh, Reform Act for government. Ganun yun, sir. So, nag-slow down talaga yung statistics natin, but what we did was, medyo inano natin, minodify namin yung schedule of delivery ng reagents namin. Yes, sir. Okay, so we're, we're uh, so uh, so okay na po tayo dun, sir, sir Patrick. So is your question was able to address by Ma'am Zarlene? So I hope so. Okay, so thank you. Thank you, sir, for uh, uh, clarifying your uh, question. So another question here. I think this one is addressed to Sir Mel. So how would you resolve the concerns of the private sector regarding SRA not given to laboratory personnel, especially since you are in the private sector? Did you receive SRA in St. Luke's, Quezon City? Um, yes, sir. We received an SRA in Quezon City um, for our COVID 
COVID um, um, staff. So, selected lang din po yung nabigyan. So, for PAMET, um, I am drafting a, a resolution na to have to issue an SRA to all medical technologists. Okay, thank you, sir. So, another question also addressed to you, sir, from Dr. Vizcara of PAMET Isabela. Since ISO internal and external audit surveillance is still happening through online virtual auditing scheme, what is your personal stand regarding the validity and quality of the audit findings done virtually relative to the continual improvement of quality management system of the laboratory processes? Uh, for me, Sir Ra Re Rally, Rally. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sir Rally, yung sa virtual na mga audit, um, medyo hindi ako kampante doon. Dahil um, pagka naka-virtual audit tayo, pwede nating um, kasing ma mabago yon And pagka mayroong mga ini-interview, pwede maging uh, ma maku-coach at the back of the, for example, ng mga cellphones or computers. So yung masasuggest ko lang dyan, ang stand ko lang, sana yung ating mga laboratories maging, um, maging honest. And um, sana ma maano natin na ma-maintain natin yung quality sa ating mga laboratories. Okay, thank you, Sir Romel. Also from Dr. Vizcara, this one naman is addressed to Ma'am Sarlene. So medyo mahaba lang po yung question. Okay lang. <laughs> locally, locally here in the province of Isabela, fast turnover of Metex from private hospitals have transferred now in the government DOH nationally retained hospital, particularly in the molecular laboratory, primarily due to the employment calling and invitation for a human resources for health program under contract of service as MT2 COS with salary grade of 15, subject to three to six months employment and secondarily to gain competence on molecular testing. In your own opinion, ma'am, what is your personal opinion with regards to the employment security, career placement, and strategic directions of these RMTs once global COVID-19 pandemic will be lifted? Okay, thank you for the question, Sorelli. Actually, um, what we have now is uh, very true sa question mo, actually. With the DOH um, help, which is the HRH, talagang meron tayong mga contract of service, mga job orders kung tawagin na ang ano is medtech 2 although may mga medtech 1 and 3 level din so during this time actually of course biglang nag-uso nga ang molecular but come to think of it hindi lang naman din covid yung useful ang PCR it's actually ngayon lang because nagboom nga during this pandemic but i know uh, molecular will always be there kasi this is uh, surveillance is always there man. It's not just during this pandemic. And as to global, actually kakaiba, kakaiba maraming work opportunities na rin ang even malift itong pandemic na to. Okay, thank you very much, Ma'am Zarlene. I think we, before we proceed with the next uh, question, type in question, meron po nakaraise ng hand, Sir Oliver, Mr. Rogelio yeah, I think. Uh, meron siyang gustong itanong directly. Mr. Ro uh, Rogelio Mejia, you're raising your hand. Okay, so siguro balikan na lang natin si Sir Rogelio. I think meron siyang gustong itanong uh, directly. That's why he's raising his hand. Okay, so this one naman is addressed to both of you. Amidst the pandemic, when do you think is the best time to initially plan and execute this personal competence and performance appraisal that I have in mind? Consider understa understaffing and generation gaps within the workplace and structure. I'm just concerned with the consistency and competency of our staff in our unit nowadays. Okay, may I answer first? Yes, Ma'am Zaylin, yes po. Okay, actually, during this pandemic, under the quality management system, dapat walang naiba eh, not even a halt or even a modification of the turnaround time. It's because uh, alam naman natin that 
yes, siguro, meron lang nababago. But it's yung COVID, very specific like testing. But eventually, ma ano din yan, it can cope up and again regain and follow the, the quality that is expected. But during this time, kung sa laboratory lang, like the clinical laboratory, I think there should be no reason na hindi ma-maintain yung competency, much more the quality of the services that we provide. Because monthly, we have our KPIs or our key performance indicators, wherein we still have to track our monthly turnaround time and even our customer service, which is part of the DOH mandate. See, so lahat non, I think the, the pandemic should not be a reason na modify ang quality of service natin. Okay, thank you very much, Ma'am Zar. So, Sir Romel? The competency ng ating mga medtech sa loob ng laboratory, um, I suggest to have a quarterly assessment to all those performing in the laboratory kasi pag masyado na nilang alam yung ginagawa nila, um, possible nag-shortcut na sila. So I suggest na to do the competency assessment every quarter. Okay, thank you. Yes, Ma'am Zarlene? Uh, yes, sir. Actually, regarding the competency, it is part of our policy internal in the laboratory to conduct a semi-annual competency of all our staff. So regardless, pre-pandemic and during this pandemic, it is still part that we do the semi-annual competency for our staff. Okay, thank you very much. Another question for, for the both of you. How do you continuously manage your operations despite many of your staffs are being tested positive? Okay, may I answer first? Go ahead, ma'am. Okay. During the past few months, Actually, it is very stressful, especially when it was already a mandate um, for all employees to have the swab test every two weeks. It's because every two weeks, yan, whether you're even asymptomatic, kung nag-positive ka, maka-quarantine ka. And thus, it will follow that my contact tracing, right? So pag na-contact trace, maybe dalawa, tatlo, or even more of your staff will be like put into quarantine. I am very happy actually to share that through the months, the section leaders are already kumbaga sanay na na manage yung section. Like other members of the team of the section actually may have extra hours but that can be uh, equivalent to compensatory time off later on. And there was a section that nung talagang nagtagipitan, we really had to step down the service of that section. But now, I'm very happy that the section uh, leaders actually kayang-kaya nang i-manage pag medyo na under, na si short na yung staff. Okay. So thank you, Ma'am Zarlene. So, Sir Romel? Um, in our area, in our institution, um, we have a close coordination with our, our um, human resource department. So we have a pool of med techs na na-interview na nila at nakapag, uh, mga, nakapag uh, medical na para just in case we have um, shortage of manpower, um, immediately ma magkakaroon kami ng mga pang supply doon sa mga babakanting position. Okay, so thank you, sir. So another question. To any of the speakers, what can be the strategy in dealing with passive management regarding the hiring of additional manpower since medtechs are working in 12-hour shifts beyond the regular 40 hours per week? Okay, may I answer? Yes, ma'am. Okay. In, actually, the government kasi everything is like in paper. <laughs> It's either a mandate that we have to follow. So, yes, I heard that the nurses, especially now that, this, that there's another surge, actually the past days, um, there was an urgent hiring for nurses. But for the clinical laboratory, we are very happy that so far we are managing. And the request for the renewal of the contract of service for 
the 40 plus stuff for the molecular laboratory is still approved. So uh, I'm not very sure, but we are actually very um, lucky that our management is very supportive. Yon. But as to kung passive yung management siguro, I think it's a bit hard because it's during this time and once management is sila yung hindi gumalaw, talagang mahirap yon. But for the, I mean, I'm speaking on behalf of our organization, which is a government institution then, very supportive ang top management. So what do we tell them actually, mga requests namin, and being considered as an essential part, I mean, or the, of the organization or the service, binibigay naman lahat. So far. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Okay. So, how about uh, do you have any additional, uh, Sir Romeo? Uh, I mean, din naman very supportive yung management. Actually, um, yung mga project base namin, if they are willing to extend, um, pinaparin yun naman agad ng contract. Tsaka, um, magsabi lang naman kami, and then we we give the situation, and they will support us. Okay, so thank you. Siguro, let's have uh, uh, last two more questions for the interest of time. And uh, don't worry, those questions that were uh, that were uh, asked or that were uh, given to us, so we will consolidate it and it will be given to our speakers. So, they will try to answer and we'll uh, give it back to you. So, uh, yun po ang gagawin natin. Kasi we, we cannot address all the questions that were raised because and dami po nito. So, we, we're just uh, um, selecting those, okay? that are of uh, talagang uh, kailangan i-address immediately. So another question here is being CMT or manager for many years. I think this one is, this question is for both of you. Being a chief medical technologist or a laboratory manager for many years, what is the best thing that you will teach to your subordinates? Okay, I again, may I start? Okay, go ahead, Bob. Okay. Um, well, as a chief medical technologist, number one is, uh, you know, to let the people know that human business, I mean, there are policies that we have to follow for the service provision and everything, but I would also like to let them know that managing, I mean, equal kasi sa akin yung soft management May, may kahalong ganon. So most often, I do some one-on-one, -on -one, you know, one-on-one -on -one talk. And pag may pumasok na, for example, na ma may I see you, yung ganon. There is the software side that I try to incorporate in my, uh, in how I, you know, manage especially the people. I mean, yes, if it comes to work, I'm in business. Yes, ma'am. You know, but I have this equally important soft side of managing people. Yun, yun lang yung gusto kong may impart. So may personal touch talaga, ma'am. Ma Meron, always. I always have this time na, not really me, but people, you know, they come to me and pag close na yung door, Alam na. <laughs> yung, yung parang ganon. Then that's the part of, you know, just listening. Listening lang. And then comes next is the motivation na. Yung ganon. Okay. So thank you, ma'am. So very engaging indeed. Okay. Yeah. Yes. It's part of it, sir. <laughs> so, Sir Romel? Like uh, uh, yes? I also agree with Ma'am Charlene. No? Yung soft side talaga meron dapat din yun. So, siyempre, um, dito sa mga staff, uh, we just have to let them feel na andun ka rin sa kanila uh, pagkailangan kanila. And then, um, siyempre, papakita mo rin naman sa kanila yung may, may firmness pa din, sa, lalo na sa paggawa ng mga decisions. So, kung, meaning, kung talagang hindi pwede, hindi pwede. Pero pag pwede, pwede naman. So, yun lang. Basta lagi ka lang nandyan sa kanila. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, I... Uh, uh, uh... Probably this will be the last. Okay, so this one is again for both of you. Can you share a little of your best practices in dealing with the current situation? Again, can you share a little of your best practices 
in dealing with the current situation. So anyone who would like to answer first, Ma'am Zarlene? Okay, actually, um, best practice during this time is uh, being safe, you know, during this time. Not just for us laboratory workers, but as well sa patients natin. Because that is what we need now. And from the start, though we have our biosafety rules, but fitting, we had to put in our guidelines fitting to the situation, especially the social distancing, the frequent disinfection, you know, the use of the mask now because of the variant, double mask. So I think that is one best practice that um, I know is very apt or uh, very necessary during this time. Aside, of course, from the best pra practice of, you know, monitoring your KPIs, you know, all those things or your key performance indicators, the best practice that we have to really inculcate and practice now are the safety practices for yourself and, of course, for the patient. Okay, thank you very much, ma'am, for your uh, sharing. Yes, Sir Romel? Um, sa amin naman, um, best practices, I think, um, um, dahil nga sa pandem pandemic ngayon, so kailangan natin na mabilisan. So in our lab, there is a um, close coordination and a quick response to all the, for all the things that we need to, to do in the lab. Okay, so thank you very much. Very much, uh, uh, Sir Romel and Ma'am Zarlene. I guess that will be uh, for the open forum. So for those who have raised their questions, kasi marami rin po ito nasa, nasa chat box natin. So we just, uh, we just uh, select yung talagang kailangan ng, ng immediate na, na attention. Okay? We will consolidate all your questions and give it to our speakers. And we will try to uh, address all your questions. So again, we have learned so much uh, to, uh, from our uh, both speakers, Mr. Romel Saceda and Ma'am Zarlene Banyana. So thank you very much. And uh, keep safe to both of you. So that's thank all you, for the open forum, Mr. Uh, Oliver. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dean Edison, for facilitating that open forum. Just by looking at the many questions in the chat box, uh, we can really tell the interest of our PAMIT members in this matter regarding the strategic leadership in the clinical laboratory during the pandemic. And thank you very much, of course, to our resource speakers for addressing the questions of our webinar participants. At this point, let me present the e-certificate of appreciation for our speakers. Let me read the certificate. The Philippine Association of Medical Technologists Incorporated, the only PRC accredited professional organization for medical technologists. This certificate of appreciation is presented to Ms. Arlene R. Banana, RMT, for the invaluable knowledge as resource speaker on the topic, strategic decision-making during pandemic, a government clinical laboratory experience, awarded virtually on September 11, 2011. Signed, the PAMET National Executive Secretary, Maria Rita Cristina S. Sebastian, and our PAMET National President, Mr. Romel F. Saceda. Thank you very much, Ma'am Zarlene. Thank you to Sir Oli and to the organizers of this uh, event. Maraming salamat po. The same certificate is, of course, awarded to our next resource speaker, Mr. Romel F. Saceda, the PAMET National President, for the invaluable knowledge uh, delivered as resource speaker on the topic Situational Leadership During Pandemic, a Private Clinical Laboratory Experience. Thank you very much, Sir Romel. Thank you, everyone. Of course, we would also like to recognize the efforts and leadership of the chair of the PAMIT Committee on Professional Development and Leadership, chaired by no other than Dr. Robert, uh, Robert uh, Manawis for his uh, very well-crafted synthesis and frameworks of the lectures that were delivered tonight. Thank you very much, Dr. Robert. So at this point, let us now end this webinar with the closing remarks from a member 
of the uh, Advisory Council of the Philippine Association of Medical Technologists. Ladies and gentlemen, for her closing remarks, we have Dr. Leila Lani M. Florento. Dr. Leila? Thank you very much. So tonight, we heard from two representatives of strategic leaders in the clinical laboratory who shared their experiences and leadership styles. Our first speaker, Ms. Sardine Bananya, discussed strategic decision-making and lab preparedness and experience in government hospital laboratory. Our second speaker, Mr. Romel Suceda, the current PAMET president, talked about situational leadership during pandemic, a private clinical laboratory experience. And uh, we heard from the third speaker, we have a very powerful professional development uh, team led by Dr. Robert Manawis, who is the chair of the, the PAMET professional development and members, um, Dr. Prida Hapan, um, Ms. Lerma Paris, and Dr. Edel Manahan. So he discussed the different styles, the models of how to become a strategic leader in the clinical lab. I hope everyone listen to him uh, very uh, carefully and to end because he discussed clearly how to become a strategic leader by just following the different style. I just hope um, the leaders I had before uh, read those different styles so that uh, we could uh, be managed uh, very uh, efficiently. The clinical lab has faced unprecedented challenges in responding to COVID-19 pandemic the lab must go on. The clinical lab management is in a world turned upside down. Management and operational ideas regarding different mod modes of communication, physical proximity and interaction, operating under a fixed budget, and maintaining a breadth of laboratory service offerings have been challenged during this pandemic. The importance of putting people first maintaining collaboration and providing effective leadership and communication throughout an organization have been highlighted. The collaborative activities of highly interdependent teams and individuals have helped the clinical lab respond to society's needs in the COVID-19 crisis, but not all lab management principles apply equally well in the course of global pandemic. In addition to the total quality management surrounding the pre-analytics, the analytics, and post-analytic processes, several key aspects of the lab management will ensure smooth running lab operation. With increased workload, these aspects can be overwhelming or easily forgotten. Therefore, laboratories should have practical checklists to guide operations within available resources. A stakeholder message, laboratories should adopt a multi-pronged strategy in assay development that are cost-effective, accurate, time-efficient, and that cater for mass testing, different clinical scenarios, uninterrupted or sustainable testing in case of supply chain failures, and enhance further research and understanding COVID-19. Due attention to lab management will facilitate smooth operations. Currently, resources to equip lab have been awarded or increased to meet the need of COVID-19 testing. A careful consideration of often effective COVID-19 testing program, plus a look into how these resources can be redefined for improved testing beyond COVID-19 and better preparedness for future outbreaks is needed. The past year and many months have been whirlwind of news about the activities in response to the emergence and spread of this SARS-CoV-2. As this pandemic unfolds, laboratory personnel are the key to the efforts to have the to halt to stop the virus spread and treat patients. The consequences of the pandemic on laboratories are likely to go beyond those of more familiar emergencies, like for example, the floods, which we usually have yearly. 
in addition to possibly overwhelming surge in patients with COVID illness, we might experience planned reductions in other patients' population, and this is really happening. A changed patient mix to mostly or nearly all COVID-19 patients, supply shortages, which was discussed by these speakers, staff shortages as team members need to self-quarantine or stay, stay home to care for family members. Initially, people come together as a team to tackle an overwhelming problem. But as time moves on and staff continue to work under stressful conditions, ignoring personal needs becomes unsustainable. And this was really uh, a sad a sad uh, um, state we are now. To make it successful through an extended high stress situation, rest has to be programmed into the plan. And this was discussed by Mom Sarli. We need to proactively identify all non-essential tasks and defer or cease them until the emergency ends. We will remember this pandemic for the rest of our lives. Clinical lab professionals, we, medical technologists, are essential members of the medical community upon which our society depends. We will rise to the occasion and make ourselves and our country proud. Take care of, our, of yourselves and each other. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much, Dr. Leila Lani Florento, for your closing remarks. Indeed, as the pandemic rages on, the lab must go on, similar to actors who must hurdle all obstacles to ensure that the show must go on. All medical technologies must actually also hurdle all of these obstacles to ensure that we maintain quality health care for our patients. This pandemic more than ever had tested the limits of our laboratories and also tested the limits of our laboratory managers. Therefore, it is laudable for PAMET to create these capacity building webinars that are designed to create a better pool of laboratory managers during this pandemic and after this pandemic had been successfully conquered. Now, for your e-certificates, you need to evaluate this webinar for your e-certificate and proof of your PAMET membership is required to access the online evaluation. The links to the online evaluation will be open for 60 minutes after the webinar. For our PAMET members who are joining us tonight through Facebook live streaming, a separate link will be posted as a comment by the PAMET Secretariat to the live stream, which you can access so that you can also get your e-certificates. Please prepare your PAMET ID because it needs to be uploaded during your online evaluation. Again, the guidelines for getting your e-certificates, you need to evaluate the webinar. For those who are here inside the Zoom platform, we will be flashing to you the link and we will also post that here in the chat box. For those who are joining us through the Facebook live streaming, the PAMIT Secretariat will put a comment to the live streaming, which you can access to get your e-certificate. Updated membership for the year 2021 is required for you to get an e-certificate for this event. And this event is credited with 1.5 CPD units, a free webinar delivered to you by the Philippine Association of Medical Technologists. So please stand by while we set up the links for the webinar so that you can access your e-certificate for this event. Again, it will be flashed here inside the Zoom room for those who are with us in this Zoom meeting. 
for those who are in joining us through live streaming, it will be posted by the Secretariat as a comment to the live feed. Thank you very much for participating in today's event. God bless the medtech profession. God bless the Filipino medical technologists. God bless PAMET. A wonderful evening to everyone. This is Oliver Shane Dumawal, the PAMET Regional Director for Southern Luzon, now concluding this webinar and virtual event.